Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Arctic Securities uh, webinar. We'll give everyone one minute to uh, dial in as we have many, many uh, clients dialing in today. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon to our European clients, and good morning to all our overseas clients, and welcome to Arctic Securities Energy Outlook webinar and our EMP and oil service top uh, stock top picks. My name is Anders Berglund. I work in the corporate finance department, and I will be moderating this session. Today, Arctic Securities published a uh, more than 370-page energy report, a masterpiece that covers the oil market outlook and oil price prediction, the EMP and oil services sectors, as well as Arctic Securities' top equity picks. Today's webinar will focus on the key findings in this report and is scheduled to last approximately one hour. We have divided the session into four parts, including a Q&A session at the back end of the formal presentations. Today's speakers will be our senior analyst, Ole Richard Hammer, who will cover the oil market development and the oil price predictions. Our EMP equity analyst, Daniel Stenslet, giving his top picks in the EMP sector. And finally, our head of equity research and oil, offshore oil services analyst, Morten Nyström, giving his top picks in the offshore oil services sector. As we have more than 200 participants on today's webinar, we will take the Q&A session of the formal presentation. If you have a question, use the question icon and enter your question, and we will address this after the formal presentation. Today, we will start the session with our senior oil market analyst, Ole Richard Hammer, that will take us through the latest development in the oil market and what we can expect on the upcoming OPEC meeting, if it will ever take place. Ole Richard, we have been through a quite remarkable period, even in a historical context. It's been a three month physical and emotional roller coaster in the oil market. We have gone through a period of despair, then a period of hope, with the oil price dropping from US dollar 60 to a negative US dollar 40, and now back up to positive $40 a barrel. Are we now moving into a period of greed and oil price shooting above US dollar 50? Will you record? Thank you, Anders. Uh, well, uh, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. We are out with uh, our report today, as Anders said. Uh, the, the, the title of the oil chapter is shaken, but fundamentally is not stirred, uh, playing into our, our view, which is that the oil market uh, was poised for a cyclical upswing into the middle of this decade before the corona hit. We believe that is still the case. And if anything, uh, the corona developments have, have, uh, have sharpened the arguments for a in favor of a cyclical upswing. I'll take you through now uh, our basic view on, on the key fundamentals uh, and our conclusion in, in terms of, of our price forecast and, and outlook. And I'll finish off with, with some comments relating to, to the OPEC meeting, which may or may not take place. Uh, we'll start with a quick look back um, at what we said uh, at our previous uh, webinar, which is exactly two months ago, almost to the date, we had three main conclusions, uh, which I think still are, are basically ballpark correct. We, we said demand is indeed collap collapsing, but it is a result of a shock and, and at least not yet from a structural shift. Uh, we said that the supply reaction uh, would come and it would be faster and bigger than what we saw in 2015. Uh, and we believed as part of that, that the big producers would cut the, uh, a deal to reduce supply when, when the time is right. So I think mo mo all of these th three things have to some extent played out. And, and uh, that's why uh, in our current report, we have made relatively few changes. Uh, we're maintaining our price forecast, $40 on Brent for this year, $50 for next year. That's basically unchanged. Uh, we're introducing a price ID, at least uh, for 2022, where we talk about the $60 to $75 range. 
uh, I think the main new point for, for, from our side is that we are clear in our view that the Corona's legacy is going to be on the supply side of the market over time, not on the demand side. Uh, we believe that the supply growth outlook has taken a major long-term hit from the price drop. Uh, that means uh, a greater chance of tightening uh, as we look into the next coming years. Uh, demand, we believe, uh, is going to, to recover, but it's probably going to be at least a two-step process where we expect about 80% uh, of, the, of the drop that we've seen, or call it collapse that we've seen in, in, into Q2, uh, is going to be recovered quite quickly as the economies open up. Getting back to, uh, the, to 100% is going to take longer uh, we believe it will take most of next year before we are there, but our very firm belief is that we will make that recovery and the peak in oil demand is still ahead of us. Um, the other, I think, new thing is that we are now sitting on, uh, on uh, um, or rather OPEC is sitting on a considerable amount of spare capacity for the first time in, in uh, a decade. Uh, we're looking at uh, about 10 million barrels per day of spare capacity. We believe OPEC and Russia will look to manage this situation differently than what has been the case over the last few years when they have uh, succeeded in tightening the market but over tightened it. We think they will use the spare capacity to manage prices into, uh, into a more moderate range for the next one to two years, which in our view is, is the timeline that they have to do so. So that's uh, that will be different, and, and that's why we think prices at current levels are going to, to stick around for a while. Okay, let's uh, move ahead uh, and talk about what has happened. Uh, I want to start on the supply side because I think that's very much where the game is going to, to be played out over the next couple of years. Uh, first graph here shows non-OPEC production, where we're comparing current developments uh, with, with, with um, the 2015-2016 situation. And as we can see, uh, non-OPEC production is already f falling quite fast. IEA um, estimates that, that uh, non-OPEC production will be down by about 5 million barrels per day uh, at the end of June compared to, to the start of the year. And that's a, very, that's a substantial drop. And it's an interesting comparison to the 2015-16 situation, which you see at the bottom, where pr production went sideways for quite some time before it slowly started to, to dip uh, at least six months after the, the, uh, after the, pr the price crash. Uh, granted, uh, Russia's situation uh, in the current setup is different. They are in a much more proactive role, and they play a, a bigger part, a much bigger part in in reducing uh, non-OPEC supply this time around. But even if you look past Russia, the situation is still the same: that non-OPEC producers are are out uh, cutting capex and reducing output at a much earlier stage, and that is a key different for, difference from the previous cycle. And if we go uh, a step further and uh, to elaborate on that, uh, I think if we look on, on uh, global CapEx developments, we're now faced with the second major downturn within the last five years. 2015, we saw CapEx drop 25%, and then it fell further the next year. Uh, IEA's estimate is that, that uh, oil and gas CapEx will be down by about a third uh, in 2020. So that is a, a, a major drop. And it's important to understand that there is a difference between these two drops because in 2015, uh, the, the oil service sectors were at the back end of a quite bullish run. And CapEx is a, is a, a nominal entity. So, so that means it's a mix of, of, of uh, volume and price. And in 2015, we had big uh, price and cost reductions from all the service providers, which played a big part in reducing CapEx that much. Uh, we all know that the service industries are definitely more stretched now. And if you look on the right-hand graph, we've got a global upstream investment uh, cost index, uh, also created by the IEA, which does show the, the substantial drop in cost which took place in 2015 into 2016. So the point is that the, 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 the ability for the, the service industries to cut costs are, is much less now. That means uh, uh, the, the cutting capex which is coming will be more volume oriented that, than in the past, and that is going to be a hit uh, to the supply outlook. 
so if we, if we move forward and start to look at some forecasts, again, I'm using IEA numbers here. Uh, on this graph, we got the growth in non-OPEC production over the last few years. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, uh, th this uh, ribbon bar, let's see if I can point to it. No, it says January 2020, which was the IEA's estimate at the start of the year for a 2 million barrel per day increase in non-OPEC production versus 2019. That's now been revised sharply lower. So we're, they're down to a minus 3.8 million barrel per day drop uh, for this year. So, so that, that is a, a, a major difference. If we look forward, uh, even it's even more important to say what, what uh, their estimate is that uh, 2025 production uh, may not recover uh, fully on, until the, or, or may, may not re recover to the 2019 peak. The IEA is saying that their 2025 production forecast already is down 2 million barrels per day. And unless CapEx recovers quickly, it could be down as by as much as 9 million barrels per day. So that is a major change. Uh, and it means that the, the, the growth outlook for, for non-OPEC production uh, which was quite meager uh, to start with because of the tail end effects of, of the 2015 CapEx cuts, Those uh, that outlook has become a lot more difficult and added in, of course, is the much more challenging situation uh, for U.S. shale, where we've seen uh, uh, another drop in CapEx now very quickly translating into uh, lower recount, less drilling and actual shut-in of wells. So a complete transformation of the non-OPEC uh, supply outlook uh, has been very, very key in, uh, in, in rebalancing the market short term. And we think this is going to be the key uh, uh, in looking at market, ba uh, market balances going forward. Um, switching to the demand side, we talk about the 80-20 recovery, uh, which is to say we believe a uh, uh, notional 80% of the demand drop will be recovered very quickly. The, the remaining 20% may take some time. A couple of key points here. Uh, number one, uh, we think that it's, it's becoming pretty clear that, that uh, the, uh, let's say, more extreme demand assessments for Q2 where, when people talked about uh, a 20 to possibly 30 million barrel per day year on year decline is not coming through. Uh, we've seen April as a terrible month, but, but the rebound has already begun in May. And, the, and the, it's important to, to realize that the second, the Q2 uh, demand uh, levels, whatever it, they ultimately may be, is at, a, at an extreme low point, maybe at the 20 to 25 year low. Clearly nothing in the modern world uh, uh, works if you dial back one of the key input factors by, by, uh, by 20 to 25 years. Main driver of this lockdown is, is not a structural shift in demand, definitely not yet, but it is uh, the lockdown on 4 billion people. That means about half the world is, uh, um, uh, is in, in a lockdown, not able to undergo uh, normal uh, business activity. Uh, and, and as that, those lockdowns ease, we're going to see uh, um, demand rebound very quickly in our, in our view. And we think we put that number at about 80% of the original drop. We think that's going to be recovered quite quickly as these lockdowns end. The fine 20% could take more time. We have estimated, guesstimated that maybe 12 to 18 months. You can see our numbers on the on the on the graph. We have the, the light blue line. The the IEA has the more bullish view. Uh, we uh, have uh, allowed for a second return of the corona next winter, and we think we will back be back to trend by the end of 2021. But the point is that we think peak demand is still ahead because economic growth is going to be, remain the, the 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 main driver of energy demand, uh, and we think the economies are going to continue to grow. And we believe that a rapid shift in the mix, uh, in the energy mix, it has become less likely because of uh, um, uh, the, the price drop. So going into 
next year we will have the tailwind of the stimulus packages that have been uh, approved left, right, and center, so to speak, recently, uh, as well as the as the um, uh, drop in prices. So we think it it will be a quite a powerful tailwind, but we're assuming it will take two years to recover fully on the demand side, as opposed to one year, which has been the tradition from all of the previous crises, and, and they have also typically recovered by more than the initial problem. So I think. I believe we have a, a relatively moderate demand outlook, but we think we're definitely optimistic relative to the levels that, that uh, we've seen this spring. Okay, so putting these things together, what does it mean for, for uh, our market balances? Uh, we got here uh, the, the demand and supply lines with the dark blue line being, being the demand line. These are our assumptions. So definitely, as we know, demand fell off a cliff to start with in March. Uh, and uh, uh, and went deep into the second quarter. Although we think, uh, as I said, that a recovery already has started in May, which means that uh, uh, some of these uh, more ex ex exceptional levels are unlikely to be realized. And it's being followed by this very quick supply reaction, both from the OPEC countries uh, and and non-OPEC led by the U.S. That means on a, that on a uh, daily demand supply basis, we think these lines will cross probably early in Q3 and we will move into, into deficit during the third and fourth quarters. I think uh, uh, at that time, we are likely to see some very, very high inventory levels, even though it's also becoming clear that we're not seeing the, the tank top scenario that, that we have been, been uh, talking about. Uh, but in, in our view, the high inventory levels are not going to prevent prices from, from recovering. For any commodity market, it is a very important point whenever demand and supply lines cross because commodities are priced at the margin. And that's also what the market currently is, is telling us, that, that things are, are moving uh, very much in, in the right direction. We've seen the contango come down very sharply uh, on the front. It's been up by $3. Now it's down to just a few cents. It's a clear indication that the market is starting, is feeling less of a, of an, uh, of a, of a surplus pressure. We're also seeing VLCC rates uh, correct down uh, sharply, indicating the same thing. So I think the, the movement on the ground is telling us that, that the market is rebalancing quite quickly. But that takes us to a sp uh, final point, which is what we believe will be somewhat of a new dynamic uh, in the oil market uh, uh, over the past decade, which is that OPEC's role uh, is changing. So you can see here from the from the um, dark blue bar on uh, sort of standing out very clearly on the left hand side, we're now looking at an uh, estimated 10 million barrel per day of excess capacity in OPEC, which is after they have uh, carried out their cuts. That, that's the highest level on an absolute basis uh, for, for you know, almost 30 years. Uh, we think that the OPEC countries will choose a different strategy this time, uh, as it arguably or in the in, of the past decade, when they have been forced to tighten the market, they have over tightened. We've got big increases in oil prices, and that has set in, in turn, a reverse cycle pretty quickly, depressing demand and encouraging other suppliers. So we think OPEC's game now is to find a, a sort of a balancing price where the minimum price would be what Saudi Arabia and Russia needs while still not encouraging supplies elsewhere. So looking at the right hand side, we can see that, uh, that uh, most of the excess supply sits in the hands of uh, Middle East producers, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, the Kuwait and, 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 and the Emirates. Then we have a uh, forecastable group, which is uh, Iran and Libya, which, which could return uh, at any point, although we think it's going to take some time. But, but in our opinion, we will see uh, a more proactive OPEC trying to steer a price into a moderate but acceptable level for them uh, and not immediately re-engineer a, a very quick, quick recovery to, let's say, a 60 to $70 price. Uh, that takes us to the to the most prominent item of the day, of course, which is what's going on with with the OPEC meeting. Uh, uh, OPEC Plus was was scheduled to meet next week uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, earlier this week, it turned out they tried to move the meeting up to Thursday. Over the last couple of days, it appears that that's been falling apart on arguments on on whether 
uh, whether or not to extend the, the deep cuts. Just as a reminder, uh, OPEC has agreed a, a two-year cut plan. As you, as you can see on the right-hand side, where we show OPEC production, including Russia, that means uh, you're looking at basically a 10 million barrel per day supply cut into the second quarter. But in that plan, uh, the cuts would start to be, get rolled back uh, starting in July uh, for a gradual rollback. So Saudi Arabia has argued that, that the deep cuts should be extended. Russia has said they, they, they would like to stay with the, with the actual plan. It appears that they have, the two now have agreed that a one-month extension uh, uh, is likely. Then we have seen numerous other issues uh, come up over, uh, especially on compliance from Iraq and Nigeria. Uh, so this is creating kind of a, a, a mixed backdrop. So uh, our opinion is that we, we think uh, OPEC will wind up signaling that they are not keen to produce a, a, a sharp increase in prices beyond the sort of the required minimum. And we think the market in the short term may have gotten a little bit ahead of itself uh, it, it does. It's not a game changer whether OPEC extends these cuts by a couple of months. It looks like it's go just going to be one month. And we think the market could be vulnerable short term uh, to uh, to a, sh a shift in sentiment. But overall, our conclusion is that we think demand is going to prove resilient. Supply has been dealt a very hard uh, uh, um, blow. Uh, and, and the supply growth is looking meager over the next couple of years. That means the rebalancing of, of, of the oil market is going to happen relatively quickly. And we believe the scene is set for a cyclical upswing in, in oil prices towards 2025. Thank you. That's it from me. And I'll pass it on. Thank you very much, uh, Ole Ricard. And uh, just a reminder, uh, you can uh, start to post your questions. Just click on the um, Q&A icon uh, and uh, post a question, and we will address them after uh, the formal presentations. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Head of Equity Research, Morten Nyström. Uh, Morten, with a 25% cutbacks in the EMP spending, across the board restructuring, right sizing of balance sheet, and general gloomy outlook, are there any attractive candidates to invest in? These days. Yes, um, that's a good question, and I will try to answer it during my relatively uh, brief uh, presentation. Um, as you see, and as you mentioned, uh, there has been a, a steep reversion of uh, the spending for 2020. Uh, what we see is now a 20% uh, decline versus 2019. And that is basically down 25% for uh, versus what we thought 2020 would look like. And on the right side, on the chart uh, or on the on the graph, you see a number of working drilling rigs, which um, tells you uh, about the situation in the offshore market. We are now down at roughly 90 units working, and that is uh, comparable with. Uh, mid 1980s and uh, we also think that uh, there is downsides uh, towards the 20% decline in spending. Um, if we look then at the cash flow situation for uh, the oil uh, companies which, is, which we argue will result in a prolonged downturn for the service industry we see on the left hand side um, that uh, the ENP companies uh, overspend uh, in capex dividend and share buybacks from early 2016. This gradually improved and actually from uh, Q4 2016 to uh, uh, fourth quarter 2019, uh, the operational cash flow uh, was roughly at par with the capex dividend and share buybacks. For Q1, however, uh, this dropped, and uh, I would point to the fact that in Q1, uh, the realized oil price was $51, and then we can imagine with $28 on average for Q2, roughly, uh, how this graph will look like in uh, Q2. Uh, also on the right side, you see the leverage uh, starting to climb, and that will increase further as we move into Q2. Uh, so, 
uh, for the service sector. Um, the graph on the uh, right hand side on the top illustrates estimate revisions for EBITDA for uh, 40 offshore companies plus. We see that that has been cut by roughly 40% for 220, 221 and 222. Uh, with the offshore drillers and the OSV uh, being hit the hardest. Um, when it comes to uh, balance sheet risk, we see uh, balance sheet uh, risk on the uh, within the offshore drillers, the OSVs, and also um, the asset heavy seismic companies, uh, companies that will survive uh, largely due to their balance sheets, <coughs> will be uh, the larger subset companies and also the asset light uh, seismic companies. On the back of uh, Ole Rickard's view and also what we see in the service sector, um, we have um, uh, we have a list of names uh, we think it's worth buying at these levels. Uh, as you can see, it is heavily tilted towards ENP companies, which my colleague Daniel will uh, talk to you about uh, soon. Uh, when it comes to the service sector, we have basically only one company, and that is uh, BW Offshore. It's an FPSO company where we see a upside of roughly 53%. Um, we also highlight uh, Acker ASA, but that is largely due to a discount on Acker BP, which Daniel will uh, come more back to. Acker. Um, it's worth mentioning that Acker's ownership in Acker BP is worth 3% more than Acker's market cap. Uh, it is likely uh, to see uh, that uh, the discount in, in, uh, in, the, in the share will come in as Ulrich Rickard's oil market view uh, comes more into play. Uh, we think this is a, a value case. Uh, 80 to 85% of the companies are listed. It trades at a 19% discount to market values and close to 50% discount based on our uh, share price target for the underlying uh, companies. When it comes to BW Offshore, um, uh, this company owns almost 40% of BW Energy. And as you see on the on the chart on the right side, you see that at current share price of BW Energy, that accounts for roughly knock eight in BW offshore. If that uh, share price in BW energy moves towards our target, that would lift BW offshore by roughly uh, 50%. Uh, the key points in our investment um, in BW offshore is a solid dividend yield of 4.5%, including uh, the buybacks. You have roughly free cash flow of 80 NOx, which is basically 50% of um, the current share price. And that is a free cash flow that will uh, be similar in 220, 221 and 222, as we see uh, no new investments in new FPSOs. It trades roughly at 3.5 times EV EBITDA. Historically, this company has traded at five to six times, while Pierce trades at seven to eight times. And probably most important. This is uh, typically viewed as a service company. Uh, however, these guys delivers free cash flow to the ENP industry. They have a uh, order backlog which sits roughly at four times 2020 revenues. And if you include uh, some of the options, that backlog increases to six times 2020 revenues. So this is a company uh, we highlight and we like. Uh, due to valuation and also uh, the dividend yield. Then I will uh, hand the word over to my colleague Daniel, which will walk you through the ENP topics. Thank you, Morten. Uh, our next speaker is our ENP uh, equity analyst Daniel, uh, with Ole Rickards' uh, positive backdrop. With the 2020 average oil price of US dollar 40 increasing to 60 to 75 range in 2022, there must be some attractive picks in your sector, Daniel. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Anush. Yes, uh, I think we can say that uh, we see ample uh, opportunities in the sector. 
despite the strong uh, share price rebounds that we've seen in the past uh, five to six weeks. Uh, my first uh, slide here uh, gives an overview of the pricing of our coverage universe, except Equinor, which we do not model bottom-up asset by asset. I think it's also important to highlight our methodology here. We estimate the gross asset values by doing a DCF field by field, and then subtract net debt to get to net asset value. Discoveries without a development plan or exploration upside are categorized as non-core assets. So uh, on your left-hand side, uh, you see how companies, companies trade uh, based on their share price uh, before opening today compared to their NAVs and core NAVs. And on the right hand side, you see how they trade on an EV uh, basis. Uh, and these net asset uh, values are based on the Brent price of 40 and 50 US dollar barrel for 2020 and 2021, followed by an increase to 60 dollar per barrel Brent thereafter. So, uh, as you have heard, we are uh, bullish on the oil price uh, longer term, um, and we actually think prices may exceed the 60 to 70 range, but uh, our recommendations and target prices are based on a $60 uh, Brent price in the long run, uh, or from uh, 2022. So, it is um, obviously easier to recommend companies uh, far to the right uh, in these uh, charts. Uh, you see that we have identified or EMP companies, uh, as we see as our uh, topics, uh, RKBP, DW Energy, Africa Oil, and Panoro. And I will come back to why we like them specifically. But first, I'll briefly touch upon some, some honorable mentions. Uh, we think Inreco is a great... Stop it a little more, Daniel. We think Inreco is a great uh, value case. Trading at an unwarranted discount when taking into consideration its scale, 30,000 barrels of production, um, it's a uh, low risk profile with hedges extending into 2022, assets being assets being operated by major total and with uh, a general low risk high value philosophy. But at the same time, uh, the share lacks uh, volume currently, uh, so that's a drawback. Uh, we think IPC is a great value case and definitely one of the winners in a higher uh, oil price scenario but it is hard to get a full overview of the future uh, pipeline situation in Canada, which investors are cautious about. And consequently, we think it's unrealistic for the company to achieve full NAV pricing in the short to medium term. Uh, for Kurdistan exposure, we find more attractive risk reward in Gulf Keystone compared to DNO. As the NAV upside is substantially higher, there's a lot of uh, undeveloped potential in its core assets. Uh, compared to Dino's assets or core assets in the Kurdistan being in decline. At the same time, uh, Gulf Keystone has a net cash position rather than a significant net debt. And we also find more attractive risk reward in Maha compared to Tetis uh, due to more NAV upside, uh, stronger production growth, or in fact, production growth compared to Tetis in, in decline, uh, and a significant, uh, uh, significantly stronger um, uh, potential of adding or increasing 2P reserves uh, over time. And lastly, Africa Energy is also a company that we like, which is fully funded for a series of high impact wells to be drilled over the next uh, six to 12 months. Spread of the Louis Bird well in Q3 kicks off the multi well campaign on Block 11B12B. Uh, and they will, in addition, be uh, carried on an exploration well on Block 2B, uh, which is going to be spread in, in Q1 2021, most likely. So this is a stock that easily could double over the next 12 months uh, in a success case. So then moving into our uh, topics, uh, RKBP uh, is our um, uh, topic large cap uh, or our preferred topic uh, among the, the large caps. Uh, and especially in comparison uh, with Lundin Energy and Equinor. So our target price of 220 in RKBP is based on our base case NAV, which I refer to as, uh, you know, $40 per barrel for 2020, 50 for 21, and 60 thereafter. Uh, and under those assumptions, RKBP trades at the price to NAV of 0.8. Um, this is uh, particularly uh, attractive compared to closest peer, uh, Lundin Energy, which trades at 1.2 under similar assumptions. Uh, despite less growth opportunities and less benefits from a uh, potential potentially revised Norwegian tax proposal. So, RKBP uh, would benefit more uh, 
given a higher share of non-sanctioned uh, projects uh, with scale. Um, on the forward curve, OCBP trades at the price to NAV of 0.94, which is also well below its historical forward uh, NAV pricing of around, around 1.3. Um, so uh, we would say that uh, OCBP is, is attractive, uh, both from an absolute relative and, and historical uh, viewpoints. What you see on the uh, production profile here and on the slide is, is uh, how OCBP looks, looks in its, uh, its sanctioned only uh, portfolio. Uh, we add some risk production from some high quality tiebacks, but it's, it's largely the, the, the sanction only portfolio that you see here. Um, and you can see that the company is, is robust against uh, prolonged low prices with a very strong uh, free cash flow yield under these assumptions. Um, the company would, for instance, be uh, cash flow neutral for 2020 down to a realized price of 30 for the remainder of the year, uh, which I think is particularly impressive considering just the 20% scale back of CapEx uh, this year. And the dividends have been lowered by 67%, but that is in line with what we expected in, in advance. And I think it's it's offering the right balance between what's responsible and, and attractive. The yield is still 4.5%, which is more attractive than in Lundin and, and Equinor. So, um, yeah. To, in, uh, as a summary, I think that the sanction only scenario represents kind of a, a valuation floor. Uh, at higher prices, we would see incremental uh, sanctioning activity, which would create further value. Um, and with um, with also 4 billion or close to that uh, US dollar in unused liquidity, should we see a prolonged uh, low oil price scenario uh, materializing? It's easy to see that uh, RKBP could leverage that liquidity to, to do opportunistic M&A moves like they've done in the past. Uh, and also, if you had backtracked the previous NAV calculations in RQBP, you would always uh, arrive at the, an underestimation of their actual value creation. So I think um, if you buy the, the, the NAV in the sanctioned only scenario, that's kind of the floor uh, value and at higher prices, or uh, if the opportunity uh, is there, you could see um, even more value creation. So next uh, company on my list is Africa Oil which is a Lumine Group company. We initiated coverage in that name earlier today. Uh, the short story here is that Africa Oil last quarter closed a transaction involving minority stakes in three world-class fields offshore in Nigeria. And we're talking 33,000 barrels of oil net to Africa Oil with an OPEX around six to seven. And these deep water fields are operated by majors, Chevron and Total. So uh, direct um, and as an offshore, direct offloading to vessels, so no onshore uh, logistical risk. And based on a $6 Brent assumption from 22, we estimate a payback time of three and a half years on an EV basis from that transaction and that five Swedish kroner per share was created in the deal. Uh, and if you uh, look at these uh, charts, you see the upfront, upfront consideration on an EV basis to the left uh, split into the net consideration paid and the uh, new net debt acquired. You can also see the cash being generated from these assets, assuming a brand price of 50 to 70. And even in the $50 scenario, uh, you can see that the upfront consideration on an EV basis will be covered before 2024. While on the right hand side, you see the cash or the net cash development in Africa oil on company level. And in the $6 scenario, you see that the market cap will be roughly covered by the end of 2024, making the remaining asset values uh, as, a, as a full upside based on today's uh, share price, which we find very attractive. As the company uh, took on a lot of debt through this transaction, it has hedged 95% of its 2020 production at an attractive level of $66 per barrel and 90% of its Q1 production from, for next year at 60. So the company is well protected from the short term uncertainty in prices. Um, and furthermore, we believe the company is well positioned for additional value creation through increased recovery in its Nigerian fields, which have a strong RR history and other African M&A opportunities, uh, in addition to its world-class exploration portfolio that I haven't really mentioned yet. But Africa Oil owns uh, roughly 32% of Africa Energy and also Impact, two exploration companies that will be drilling high impact wells uh, targeting uh, multi-billion barrel prospects 
already in Q3. So those are two additional big triggers for, for Africa oil as well. I think it's also uh, worth pointing out that Africa oil has just rebounded 30% from its trough before opening today, now probably 40%, but uh, from its trough in, in March, uh, while other companies in its peer group uh, already has doubled or close to that. So I think the timing here really is, is excellent. Uh, Panoro, uh, it's often being perceived as a bit more risky high beta stock. So I think I'll, I'll start this section by addressing some of its more defensive qualities. Um, with solid uptake agreements with BP as the counterparty, it's 2020 liftings uh, tilted towards the second half and uh, when you know the worst hopefully is over uh, regards to, to Corona and then operating uh, cash flow break even level of 25 dollars per barrel and at the same time having a strong net uh, or uh, $24 of, of cash and also uh, a very low remaining part of, of uh, committed capex of $5 million. So, so uh, the remaining cash also in a, in a neutral cash flow situation will also be sufficient and with hedges on top of that covering 30% of its production uh, for this year and next year at or above $55 per barrel. I'd say that the company is a very robust position also in, in the current environment. In our base case, as you can see on the graph uh, to the bottom left, you can see that our the current discoveries with the plan is worth uh, 20 NOx per share in our base case. All the current discoveries um, and uh, the risk, risk exploration upside is included uh, in the non-core NAV, which could add another 30 NOx uh, per share. And uh, a thing that we like with Bonoro is that it has a, a very strong uh, growth potential um, and it can, uh, just by monetizing the very core of its portfolio, be able to uh, deliver a dividend yield of 20% in our base case um, and uh, deliver a sustainable growth from that 20% uh, level as, as illustrated by, by these graphs. So just by sanctioning a uh, field Rouge phase one, I'll touch upon that later, but that's included in the operating cash flow estimates and it's it's uh, providing a very uh, strong cash flow yield in the company, especially um, yeah, compared to its uh, its market cap. Um, if we go to the next slide here, I'm, I'm showing you um, the map of the Dusapu license and its uh, current discoveries and remaining prospects and leads in, in different colors. You can see the, the producing uh, field, Torchu, and also the uh, upcoming uh, fields uh, that, that are uh, subject to sanctioning uh, when we see easing of uh, corona restrictions, that is Rouge, Rouge, Northeast and Hibiscus. And you can also uh, probably uh, imagine for yourself the, the potential here with, uh, with so many untapped uh, uh, prospects and, and leased uh, on the map. And several of these prospects are material uh, with uh, P50, prospective P50 sizes above 50 million barrels and the chance of su success uh, in excess of 50%. So if you compare what's been found so far with the actual potential of the license, there's no doubt that uh, we have a, or there's a bright exploration uh, uh, outlook for, for this license, uh, which will uh, come at focus at, at higher prices. And uh, there are at least 13 unreal prospects uh, estimated by uh, operator BW Energy uh, covering uh, 281 million barrels of prospective resources. And as two exploration wells were sufficient to discover Rouge and Hibiscus to the northwest, uh, uh, you can imagine for yourself the, the gross production profile to the upper left if, if more discoveries are made and you can extend the uh, production plateau at around 40,000 barrels for, for a longer time. And some of the top ranked prospects, uh, Nepal, Hibiscus North and Prospect B, if those turn out to be discovered, it's, it's absolutely possible to extend this plateau for uh, probably five years or, or, or even more. And if you just look at the valuation of BW Energy in, uh, in this is a, a low case, I'm assuming $40 Brent flat going forward, and also assuming just sanctioning of Rouge phase one, so no phase two and no, no other projects contributing, just looking at how would the company look if you uh, just sanction one more project and, and look at the valuation metrics, cash flow yield, uh, price to earnings, and even to EBITDA on those assumptions. 
and you can see that uh, even in, in a four dollars Brent flat scenario, uh, the EV goes into the negative territory in 2024, and the free cash flow yields uh, lies in the range 30 to 50 percent in the years 2023 to 25. So this is the low case. If you look at our base case, um, again, 50 for next year and 60 dollars Brent for 2022 and, and thereafter. The company reaches negative EV territory already in 2023 and has, in fact, an 80% uh, cash flow yield uh, the same year. Um, obviously, no, no other incremental capex and huge phase one included here, but it just gives you an idea of how uh, attractive this could be uh, cash flow wise uh, as well. And what I show here lastly is um, how the core NAV uh, develops by varying the, the brand price and uh, uh, the WAC uh, for, for quite a broad range in, in both directions. And you can see that, um, and also I have to mention the core NAV here includes producing assets torture phase one and two and the currently uh, or the, the postponed development of Rouge phase one and also Rouge phase two. Uh, and if you assume those two uh, developments into the into the core now, um, you, you can see here that there's a, there's actually upside from the current share price even down to a, a brand price of 40 uh, using a, a VAC of 16%, uh, at least there was upside before uh, trading today. So uh, again, I think uh, BW Energy really stands out as uh, perhaps the, the, the top pick among our top picks, just based on its very attractive valuation and uh, and uh, high quality asset in, in, in Dusatu and also its strong uh, net cash position. So my last uh, slide here is really uh, just a summary of the, of the top picks and, and the target prices. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, RKBP is our preferred uh, top uh, topic candidate among the, the larger caps and and in the medium to, to small cap segments, I think uh, BW Energy, Africa Oil and Panoro, for those of you who can, who can take uh, emerging market risk is, is really three cases to, to look into and, and, um, and get invested in. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And um, we are now opening up for the Q&A session. Uh, we have already a couple of questions uh, available, but please click on the icon, uh, the Q&A icon, and uh, post your questions. We'll start off with one question for uh, for Daniel here. Um, what is your view on Equinor's uh, US uh, onshore portfolio in terms of value, and what do you think uh, the company will do with these uh, assets? I think uh, the worst thing they could do is to just uh, try to get rid of these assets in the current environment. Um, those are assets that are high up on the cost curve. Uh, they're not worth uh, very much at, at current prices, but uh, Equinor has uh, some tremendous uh, tax loss carry forwards relating to those assets. So if prices return to the um, 55, 60 and above that, uh, going forward, um, it's um, they they become they they go from being uh, close to no value to to an extremely high value because they they have this um, this uh, extreme gearing to, to higher prices and and no tax related to them. So um, I think uh, yes, they have value, uh, but it's obviously dependent on on your view on the price. Um, and they they uh, what what I would do if I if I was uh, Managing Equinor would be to, to to sit and wait, and if if we see a price spike where we could uh, see uh, attractive bids on those assets, then I would be open to to divest. But um, I think it's uh, yeah, because I, I would divest because uh, Equinor's core competence is, is within offshore. That's where they have a competitive edge. Um, so so uh, that's um, that's my take on the on the onshore portfolio. Thank you, Daniel. Next question goes to Uli Rickard. If oil reaches 45 to 50 plus price, wouldn't shale kick back in to depress the price back towards the $40 level or below? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think the price would have to be higher. Uh, and, and we're operating on the assumptions that we need the uh, WTI prices 
north of $50 per barrel to, to break even on drilling new wells. We think in order to attract capital inflows into the sector, uh, we think prices need to be closer to 60 and have to stay there for some time, i.e. three months. So we don't see a, a new dynamic in the shale patch until maybe a, a year from now. That means uh, um, increases in production are, are likely uh, uh, only until the, uh, not until the second half of next year. I think shale also, uh, you know, I will have to pay the price uh, as it were of, of uh, uh, more restricted ESG based investments. So the threshold to invest uh, across any kind of fossil uh, uh, supply industry has been raised. Uh, and, and, and that means it, it will be tougher for shale as well to, to um, uh, uh, increase production. Having said that, though, uh, we, we do believe that some we should not be extrapolating some of these more extreme production drops that we're seeing now, because undoubtedly uh, part of that is, is due to uh, uh, productive shale wells getting shut in. Those wells, uh, these, some of them will come back on stream later this year. They have a, a certainly lower break-even costs, uh, etc. So we're going to see some bounce in, in, in shale production from a low point probably uh, uh, sometime in the midsummer. Uh, but I think uh, the, in, in terms of, of, of having a dynamic reinvestment uh, part of the, of the shale sector, uh, I think that is further ahead of us. Uh, also, I may add, I think uh, shale will come back in a much more consolidated way. Uh, the, big, uh, the big players will, will take market share in this downturn. And to me, that spells uh, one objective, getting higher prices, which means uh, a, a much more moderate uh, CapEx uh, cycle going forward. A follow-up question here. Is there an upside case uh, to your thesis uh, where you have a combination of continued reduced EMP spending and permanent shutdown of U.S. shale uh, production? That could move your forecast even higher than the sixty to seventy dollar uh, barrel. Yeah, I think I think there's an there is an upside case to it, but I I, I think you you would have to really be confident on uh, that some of the geological uh, issues that uh, are challenges that have been flagged to, to shale, i.e. parent child uh, well problems, etc., would indeed be very real problems and and stick deeper. We are operating under the assumption that that uh, uh, many of the shutdowns we've seen of producing wells, as I said, they, they, will, they will return. So, uh, and, and also I think uh, if you're, the other assumption you need to have is, is, is that the OP, uh, OPEC, i.e. Saudi Arabia and Russia really will not be comfortable at, at uh, or cannot really live in the low 40s for, for a long time and would have to do as they've done before and try to uh, and let prices go higher uh, once the market starts to turn. Thank you, Ricardo. Next question goes to Daniel. Uh, this is again on uh, Equinor. Is there a um, is there a case uh, where you can see that uh, uh, the, the the drop in asset prices in in the North Sea will lead uh, Equinor to refocus and uh, grow uh, their uh, presence in in the North Sea um, as opposed to continue to develop their green initiatives? I think they have the capacity to do both. Um, it's not really an either or uh, question. Um, if if uh, sufficient um, uh, field prospects and field sizes were available, uh, I think uh, def definitely Equinor would, would look into that. Now they, they have this um, uh, electrification strategy to, to comply with as well. So it's that makes things things perhaps a bit more complicated but uh, if there's uh, if there's uh, offshore fields either undeveloped or developed with uh, two C upsides that are not really um, not really explored uh, thoroughly I think that's that's attractive for for Equinor to, to look at and um, when I look at uh, at uh, M&A uh, transactions I think um, Offshore fields not performing at their uh, at their potential is, is something that they, they definitely have high on their on their list. Thank you. And a question for um, uh, Morten. We've seen um, we've seen that uh, during this uh, downturn, the EMP companies reacted extremely fast to the changes in the oil price and uh, with our oil price outlook. Is there any chance that we will see they react? The other way again, with an increase in uh, their EMP spending, um, 
over the next six to 12 months? Or mm. will they be relying on a more stable oil price at a higher level? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think the best way to answer that is actually to rewind a couple of years. Um, the oil price, if I'm correct, roughed in Q1 2015 at below $30. It rebounded quite quickly. And the majority of analysts at that point said that 2016 would turn out to be better than 2015. Um, then we enter into 2016 and things didn't improve. Uh, so the majority of the analysts said then that 2017 will be better than 2016. That did uh, not turn out either. Uh, so then um, they said 2018 will be better than 2017. And actually post-summer, uh, it started to be uh, better. Um, what I'm saying is that um, when you had this uh, reduced activity from the ENP companies back in 2014, 2015, it took actually 3.5 years before you saw any rebound in um, offshore activity. So uh, yes, obviously, um, a higher oil price will probably uh, reduce the downturn, but to see spending increases, uh, we think that will take uh, years and not months. Thank you, Morten. Uh, as there is no further questions uh, from the audience, I think we'll uh Say thank you to uh, the participants and we wish you all a uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much.